Hello, my name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's virtual discussion with Dr. Rafael Ocasio on his new book, Race and Nation in Puerto Rican Folklore, Franz Boaz and John Alden Mason in Puerto Rico. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who've offered their guidance, their expertise, and provided us with opportunities for collaboration. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who've made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over $1 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who we feel really need the support the most. Our library museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. I hope you'll check out our website, amphilsoc.org, and we'll make sure we'll put that in the chat box to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. Today's talk intersects with the work of the APS Library Museum's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. CNAIR, as we call it, works with indigenous communities throughout the Americas and with campus and community-based scholars in many disciplines and traditions. CNAIR's goal is to assist people in finding and utilizing the extensive archival collections at the Library Museum in innovative ways that honor indigenous knowledge, cultivate scholarship, and strengthen languages and cultural traditions. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't give a plug, a good reminder that the APS is currently accepting applications for its Indigenous Community Research Fellowships. These are fantastic opportunities designed to enable research in the APS's collection in support of Indigenous community-based priorities. You can learn more about these fellowships on our website. And again, we'll put another link uh, directly to those fellowships in the chat box. The Library and Museum is home to the papers of anthropologists such as Franz Boas and John Alden Mason, who you're going to learn a lot about today. We're excited to be able to host today's discussion about a lesser known episode in the history of this field. Uh, just a little housekeeping, we are using Zoom webinar today for today's discussion, so not to worry, you've all been muted. Now, if you have a question, we hope you will ask it at any time. All you need to do is find the Q&A button, which is going to be in the center bottom navigation bar of your screen. Type your question in when it pops into your head. We're gonna have plenty of time for a conversation with our speaker at the end of today's presentation. We are also offering closed captioning for today's virtual discussion. If you'd like to use it during the panel, please just click on the CC box, again, on that bottom navigation bar. Uh, it is just to the right of the Q&A button. And now to our speaker, the reason you're all here today. Uh, Professor Rafael Ocasio is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Spanish at Agnes Scott College. Decatur, Atlanta, Georgia. He's the author of two books on dissident writer Reynaldo Arenas, Cuba's Political and Sexual Outlaw from 2003, and The Making of a Gay Activist from 2007. Uh, now, Professor Casio actually has many, many works out there. I just want to give you a few uh, highlights from what he's published since then. Uh, these include such important works as Latin American Culture and Literature, published in 2004, Afro-Cuban Costa Vermiso, uh, From Plantations to the Slums, 2012, the Bristol, Rhode Island and Matazanas, Cuba Slavery Connection, The Diary of George Howe from 2019. And I guess the, the pandemic has been a productive time. He's got two more books coming out in addition to the one he's talking about today. Uh, Folk Stories from the Hills of Puerto Rico uh, coming out in 2021. And from the University of Florida, University Press of Florida is his book on the late Cuban dissident uh, returning to Renato Arenas. Uh, Pedagogy of Dissidents, Queering Sexuality, Politics, and the Activist Curriculum. Well, uh, Dr. Casio, you've just given me a long reading list of things that I want to get to over the next couple of months. But today, you're going to be talking about race and nation in Puerto Rican folklore, Franz Boas and John Alden Mason in Puerto Rico. Uh, we will be putting a link to the book again in that chat. And there is uh, the publisher has graciously given us a discount code for today. Uh, so if you enjoy today's conversation, I really hope that you'll go out and purchase the book. So with that, I'm going to take myself down and bring up our speaker.
Good afternoon. Thanks to Adriana Link, Head of Scholarly Programs, Library and Museum at the American Philosophical Society. And many thanks to Kyle Roberts, Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at American Philosophical Society for um, your exciting introduction. To you all, many thanks for taking the time to listen about these books that as I will hopefully effectively communicate means so much to me. With the end of the Spanish American War in 1898, followed in Puerto Rico by the establishment of a US military government, along with Cuba and the Philippines, U.S. Americans came to view these newly acquired our possessions through travel promotional media and other types of technical documents, such as detailed maps that encouraged massive exploration of the renamed island of Puerto Rico. In response to quench such consumerist interest, American academic and scientific institutions frequently performed research in Puerto Rico. In 1913, the New York Academy of Sciences, hosted by the Puerto Rican government, started preliminary arrangements for the scientific survey of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. A comprehensive study of the island's geology, paleontology, botany, zoology, and anthropology, it also included active participation by the New York Botanical Gardens and by Columbia University. Their findings were published in a series of volumes beginning in 1919 and continued until 1941, a project that has been described as, quote, to this day, one of the most complete descriptions of the natural history of any tropical area ever attempted. The scientific survey of Puerto Rico included complex anthropological, anthropometric, and oral folklore field research undertaken under the direction of Dr. Franz Boas, known today as, quote, the most important single force in shaping American anthropology in the first part of the 20th century, end of quote. A young scholar, archeologist and linguist, Dr. John Alden Mason was assigned to collect an extraordinary number of samples of oral folklore, such as poetry, songs, conundrums, folk stories and legends as part of a trip that extended into a year, 1914 to 1915, to prepare for Boas's arrival on the island. Boas joined Mason for a month in May of 1915. Although Boas had traveled to Puerto Rico shortly after having facial surgery that removed a potentially cancerous tumor, he kept a busy work schedule. The most significant finding by Boas and Mason was their archaeological digging of was their archaeological digging of quote the ancient village site of Capa end of quote known today as the Centro Ceremonial Indígena de Caguana among the largest Taino ceremonial ballparks in the Caribbean. Mason provided Boas detailed reports while surveying Capa and documenting other unexplored nearby archeological sites. Mason also maintained Boas well informed about his field work while collecting oral folklore throughout the island, including detailed reports about his unique ways in which he eventually managed to gather such a large, large collection. This correspondence is available at the American Philosophical Society and is the main source of data in my book Race and Nation in Puerto Rican Folklore, Franz Boas and John Alden Mason in Puerto Rico. Most of Boas's stay in Puerto Rico was devoted to anthropometric documentation of boys and men, data that sourced his only article written about his trip to the island. Boas himself arranged for the Puerto Rican government to survey the privately owned plot and recommended that Capa be purchased and preserved as an archeological park. The action would have protected the area from illegal excavations that had already begun. 
his recommendation did not become reality until 1956 under the administration of Luis Muñoz Marin, the first Puerto Rican governor elected by pop popular vote. The eventual restoration of Capa has directly impacted a community of Taino descendants, both in Puerto Rico and in the United States, who have, bec who have come to consider this site as their rightful ancestral home for the performance of religious and social ethnic indigenous celebrations. Upon his arrival on the island on December 1914, as he reported to Boas, Mason also started transcribing and recording of songs by means of an Edison cylinder recorder. The songs were recorded on wax rolls to be played on a small jam Edison phonograph. Proudly, Mason indicated to Boas on January 5, 1915, that he had located, quote, two very good singers who are eager to sing for a slight com compensation, end of quote. These musical samples from the early part of the 20th century are among the first such modern recordings produced in Puerto Rico for the purpose of linguistic investigation. Boas supervised Mason on a second extensive field research project. Mason was charged with documenting rural oral folklore through transcriptions of his conversations with peasants of varying ages and a variety of geographical locations. According to Mason, two geographical areas in particular, Old Loisa, a former runaway slave settlement, and Utuado at the heart of a strong peasant culture yielded an unstated higher number of folk stories. No explanation was offered for the oppositional importance of these geographical sites. Located at the Cordillera Central on a mountainous range, Utuado was, a, was an important agricultural center dominated by the Jibaro or the Puerto Rican peasant. It is also home to Capa, an area that Boas and Mason got to know extremely well. Loisa, located on the northeastern coast of the island, had been founded as a fishing village inhabited predom predominantly by former enslaved individuals. Even today, Loisa is recognized as an important repository center of Afro-Puerto Rican cultural traditions that Mason often referred to as, quote, Negro culture, end of quote. As in the case of Lois, as, as in the case of Futuado, Loisa had developed a particular type of musical expression known as bomba. Mason's reason for spending time in Utuado and Loisa was an intentional decision. He came to consider these two geographical sites as good cent as, as quote, good centers of Hibaro and black cultures, end of quote. Hibaro folklore, such as tales, legends, and short anecdotes, dominated the oral project. In 1916, the Journal of American Folklore began the publication of Mason's compiled folk material edited by Aurelio Espinosa, also a folklorist and an associate of Boas in previous public projects. Espinosa edited all the story samples gathered by Mason to conform to the traditional Spanish grammatical structures, or as he insisted to Boas on October 9, 1916, quote, in as correct Castilian as possible, end of quote. Espinosa also standardized the vocabulary of the agrarian practices of Hibaro so storytellers while providing alternative terms that were easily understood by international speakers. Regrettably, the original texts did not survive. Today, there is no way to perform a comparative analysis of Espinosa's edit editing processes, turning the Hibaro's grammatical structures into quote, correct Castilian, end of quote, or to review his methodology of sanitizing the rather colorful vocabulary of the Puerto Rican countryside. Scholars have been under the impression that Mason's oral 
research in Puerto Rico was published in its entirety. I have identified, however, two types of unpublished materials as the abundant correspondence between Mason and Boas at the American Philosophical Society indicate, Mason gathered folk songs and notations about his conversations with an old man that Mason referred to as, quote, a former slave born in Africa, end of quote, who served as his cultural informant about Afro-Puerto Rican religious beliefs and use of green medicine as observed by blacks in Loisa. Of great, of great historical value, Meliton Congo also spoke to Mason about enslaved customs that had survived after, after the abolition of slavery in 1873. Why Mason and Boas chose not to publish any of this, quote, slave-based folk material, end of quote, is still my most puzzling theoretical question. As I started my research that eventually led to my book, Race and Nation in Puerto Rican Folklore, one issue was rather obvious to me, both as a literary critic and as a Puerto Rican. For a folklorist, a noticeable absence in Mason's letters to Boas was their silence about the political importance of their collected, of their collected samples of Puerto Rican folklore. Whether from rural or from city traditions, many of them were widely covered in daily newspapers or in cultural magazines. Indeed, at the time of, Bo of Mason's field research in Puerto Rico, local folklorists were heavily involved in a similar project. Literary writers, political analysts, and politicians were simultaneously engaged with a pro-nationalist project. Jibaros, depicted as white people of Spanish descent, became identified as representatives of a well-developed Puerto Rican identity. Their close attachment to ancestral Spanish traditions that had adapted to the island's rural setting had created a vibrant hybrid culture that even today is seen as the heart of the Puerto Rican nation. In the early part of the 20th century, when US laws started imposing political control over the island, compilations of local folk tales appeared, started appearing in Puerto Rico. Documentation of certain types of Puerto Rican characters, such as Juan Bobo, the know-it-all, pretend to be dummy or a mischievous child character had become synonymous with the ingenuity needed to survive harsh social, socioeconomic conditions. In fact, Juan Bobo's, Juan Bobo's stories are still most frequently published in English translations in the United States as a representative of a strong Puerto Rican cultural identity. In Puerto Rico, Juan Bobo's stories continue to appear as a sort of psychological analysis of a stubborn Puerto Rican identity in opposition first to mainstream culture and later as an ideological weapon against US aggression of native popular belief systems. Yet, a controversial aspect of Mason's field research was his close relationship with peasants, his favorite informants of rural oral folklore. From his conversations with Hibaros, Mason would have been immersed in their struggles to achieve workers' rights. He would have witnessed the impact of drastic changes in agricultural production, such as the installation of huge grinding centrales American-owned sugarcane plantations and refining centers that came to dominate the Puerto Rican rural landscape. These immense factories would impact negatively the social fabric of peasant culture that Mason often referred to in his letters to Boas. At the end, the rather apolitical view of Puerto Rican oral folklore as published in the Journal of American Folklore may be responsible for the lack of attention by both US and Puerto Rican scholars. Scholars then and even today continue to ignore one important component in the collection process of hundreds of samples of oral folklore, the, authentic the authentication of the largest possible number of samples was Mason's goal as part of an extensive process that led to that 
that had led the support of the administrators of the Puerto Rican public school system. Through them, Mason gained access to numerous school children in rural areas who were asked to write down oral folklore pieces. Mason traveled extensively throughout the island, visiting schools and training teachers in how to instruct children on documenting techniques. Indeed, Boas himself understood the value of these samples written by Hibaro school children. Upon his return from Puerto Rico in, the early, in early July 1915, Boas briefly described to the New York Academy of Sciences board Mason's oral collection as, quote, many hundreds of folk tales, riddles, rhymes, ballads, songs that will give us a clear insight into the traditional literature of the island, end of quote. He was hopeful that the stories would have a utilitarian value while referring to the role of the Puerto Rican Department of Education as an important agent in the actual collection of the oral folklore pieces. Boas revealed an expectation that this material could, quote, furnish reading matter for the rural schools attractive and interesting to the children, end of quote. As I stress in my book, unbeknownst to Boas, and most importantly, for the first time in the literary history, the Jibaros, the iconic inhabitants of the Puerto Rican countryside, became the writers of their own stories. The in ingenuity they used to transform well-known international folklore, folk, folk tales and fairy tales into stories that appeal to a rural imagination was certainly outstanding. Additionally, the children adapted legends and historic anecdotes to serve their own needs, whether as a source of entertainment or as a formal means of literary expression. I should also stress, however, that adult storytellers, well known in their rural communities as echadores de cuentos or storytellers also wrote for, Bo for, for Mason. These individuals worked hard as Mason reported to Boas on January 12, 1915, they took, great, they took great pride in, quote, making a real effort not to duplicate material, end of quote. Mason, ultimately, Mason was ultimately satisfied with the work done. Quote, the material on the whole is very well written, both as regards style and orthography, end of quote. Unfortunately, the stories appeared in publication without an indication of the, of the type of transcription method used or any information about the identity of the informant, such as, a, as, such as geographical location or name. In conclusion, these rural oral folk stories as components of Puerto Rican social practices are reflection of a type of cultural identity deeply rooted in a transatlantic and Caribbean post-colonial history. A testimony of the appeal of Mason's stories is evident in the, con in the continued printing of certain types of stories by, by um, I'm sorry, let me start back. Um, a testimony of the appeal of Mason's folk stories is evident in the continued printing of certain types of stories by writers in both Puerto Rico and the United States who still make these characters repositories of a vibrant, distinctive Puerto Rican national identity. And now I have a surprise for you. Folk stories from the hills of Puerto Rico, cuentos folclóricos de las montañas de Puerto Rico, also appearing um, uh, from Rutgers uh, University Press in um, 2021 is my um, edited um, versions of um, these stories. And I want to show you um, some information about the chapters. Um, the first chapter, um, Hibaro, Readaptations of Fairy Tales, Snow White and La Cenizosa, or Cinderella, groups rural adaptations of two popular international fairy tales, Snow White and, C and Cinderella. Whether school children actually wrote these stories is not as important as the deviations from the original tales, 
Some of the new components celebrate rural traditions common to the Puerto Rican countryside. The stories also incorporate local, local religious customs and key supernatural characters such as fairy godmothers and evil and good witches. Chapter two, Rescuing Encantados, gathers stories that explain the circumstances surrounding people who have been turned into animals or plants through a spell uttered by a mean-spirited spirited individual, often a witch or a disappointed parent. Although the length of the curses varies, they can only be lifted through the intervention of kind-hearted kind individuals. It is not an easy task though. In the stories, the rescuer must go on a quest through dangerous rural settings or unknown supernatural geographies, only after proving their unconditional love, mostly in the case of girl or young women protagonists, or performing brave acts, enduring physical or emotional pain, both girls and boys, do they successfully break a terrible spell. As in the traditional fairy tale, their reward is a handsome prince or a beautiful princess who will in return bestow upon them innumerable riches. Chapter three, Fantastic and Impossible Quests, features stories whose protagonists bravely overcome the perils of voyages into the unknown, either through their inventive alertness or by supernatural means that favor their cause. As in other stories of enchantment, only the one character who follows a simple piece of advice is triumphant, but not without experiencing the wrath of his jealous siblings. One story in particular highlights young um, protagonists willing to face supernatural, supernatural elements. Only one brother is triumphant though, because he trusted the blessing and could use his magic object effectively. I should stress that the tradition of asking for a blessing or in Puerto Rico, dame la bendición, give me, give me your blessing uh, from your elders is still much alive on the island, at least in my family. Chapter four, Juan Bobo's, Juan Bobo, a deceiving trickster presents picaresque stories of the well-known mischievous child who frequently finds himself in trouble with his mother, neighbors, or strangers. Although his adventures often bring him into borderline criminal situations from which he successfully escapes, sometimes unscathed, he's also frequently fixed, physically punished. His name has a double connotation, a witty boy or a, or a young guy who, while pretending to, pretending to be a simpleton, emerges triumphantly from adventures, many of them with a comical ending. But he's also a bobo, a dummy, a rural nickname for a mental disability that makes him the butt of numerous cruel jokes. In either case, Juan Bobo finds himself involved in events that end badly for those unfortunate characters with whom he comes in contact in a number of comical anecdotes that are still frequently reproduced in Puerto Rico as prime readers for school children or as inspiration for fiction writers. Chapter, um, so that was chapter four. Chapter five, Beware of Strangers, groups three versions of reinterpretations of the iconic ch child characters, Hansel and Gretel. There are some notable deviations from the original fairy tale, a consistent message in the stories with children as protagonists is that adults can indeed be foes. Orphans such as Cinderella, Snow White, and the local versions of Hansel and Gretel are abused at the hands of their stepmothers who are presented as strangers and thus potential enemies. Bio biological mothers can also inflict pain, however, as seen in the Juan Bobo stories. More tragically, they can even kill their children. Six, chapter six, El Pirata Cofresi, a national hero and other notable bandits gathers legendas, legends of the most dreaded of thieves, the infamous Puerto Rican born 
Roberto Cofresi y Ramírez de Arellano, 1791-1825, whose Robin Hood-like deeds make him a popular protagonist of adventure stories. He is infamously known for daring robberies at sea that took him from, from his operational base on Cabo Rojo's western coast to nearby ports in the Dominican Republic and the surrounding islands of the Lesser Antilles, even as far as Lima in Peru. The last chapter, Brief Stories and Anecdotes, gathers a variety of pedagogical, brief short stories and funny anecdotes that draw heavily from rural settings, popular characters, and plot lines that were well known among Jibaros. Together, the stories reflect strong survival lessons and stress best practices for surviving life in the countryside, including stories that warn individuals about acting selfishly against the well being of their community. The lesson is, however, always the same. The kind-hearted person who faces a bully with a quick and smart thinking and sometimes magical interventions defeats the villain's wicked ways while improving their own destitute lives. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you. You gave us a two for one. I think that was, uh, <laughs> so we have uh, questions that are coming in uh, to the Q&A. Um, I have a long list of questions. Maybe I'll just start with one as people are sort of thinking about what other things they want to ask you. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you locate this work. And I, I can see the, the very clear connections, right, between uh, the Boaz and Alda Mason and then this anthology. Um, where does this fit into your larger trajectory? I, I think we see you thinking about sort of Arenas uh, early on, uh, then moving over to sort of Cuba and slavery. Um, is this is this a project of love? Are you getting back to your roots here, or so it's it goes both ways. Um, but um, I will have to say that um, today, as I think about it, um, it's going back to my roots. Mm -hmm. um, Adriana and I were um, chatting a couple of days ago, and um, she did ask me um, how I started um, working on these stories. Um, the stories, um, some of the stories or many of the stories are very well known even today. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to know these stories not only through family members who um, were very well known as uh, storytellers within my family environment, my grandmother in particular, but also through the work of Judith Ortiz Koffer. Judith Ortiz Koffer comes as um, the first Latina writer to be nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in 1989, the same year that Oscar Huelos, a Cuban American, was um, nominated for the prize and won the Pulitzer Prize, being the first Latino to, to win the prize. Um, Judith was very much in, um, influenced by um, these stories. Mm -hmm. um, Judith and I were very good friends, and um, 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 toward the end of, of her life, um, she had uh, started a project that um, would have published um, some of these stories in her versions, her, her version that um, she called um, my Puerto Rican, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember um, the way that she described them, but um, it was her, her revamping of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, some of you, when, when you read the book, you will see that the dedication to this book is um, to her. Um, she not only, um, was a very good friend, but um, she was also um, an inspiration uh, to, to be a writer. Uh, I don't think I will ever be a writer the way that she was. So, so Judith, uh, anyway, now that we're speaking about her, so Judith, this is for you. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's so fantastic. And I think, uh, I think that's really, really admirable to sort of continue and, and, to, and to do that in her honor. Uh, so one of our guests in the audience asks, um, if you would share your favorite story uh, from that uh, anthology or one maybe that didn't make it into the anthology. So all of, I will have to say that um, writing this anthology was, was um, um, an act of um, pure um, pleasure. And I went for the stories that I liked the best. Okay. Um, the, my, my favorite one are the stories of Seni Sosa or Cinderella. 
for those of you who know Spanish, you will um, recognize that ceniza means um, ashes. So cenizosa is um, the, the girl that is covered with um, ashes. The reason that I like uh, these stories in particular is that some of the stories do not have a uh, prince that comes to, to her rescue. Mm -hmm. um, Cenizosa uh, rescued herself, of course, through, through the intervention of um, the Ada Madrina. Actually, she has tres Adas Madrinas. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the story are connected through an object. Um, um, one, of the, one of the gifts that uh, Cenizosa gets from one of the Ada Madrinas is a varita de la virtud, um, which I, in, in, in the anthology, I translate as the um, virtue, the want of virtue. Mm -hmm. And um, that want comes very handy um, in many stories. Um, and as I said, there's the, there is no prince and, and uh, Senisosa is a hibara. Senisosa um, works in the, in the field and, and the dirty work, one of the dirty work, um, that she's assigned by the, the wicked uh, stepmother is washing um, the tripes in the river in order to make uh, mondongo. If you are familiar with Caribbean um, mm -hmm. culture, you know that mondongo is that uh, tripe stew that um, some people love. There are, the questions are rolling in. So, and I'm, and I'm, I feel like I, I think I'm gonna ask the, the one that's come in most recently and I'll sort of work my way back. And I think it comes out of what you're saying right now. Um, this anthology, right, is a work, um, it's, a, it's a, a work continuing your colleagues' work. It's a work continuing your own work, um, but does it fit into a larger landscape? Are there larger cultural efforts underway in Puerto Rico right now to, to either revive and or to keep these traditions alive? Yes, yes. Um, there is. A the, 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 the stories, um, well, let's talk about these Mason stories. Um, the Mason stories, um, only a handful of um, Puerto Rican scholars are aware of um, the Mason um, stories. The ones that are aware of the stories often do not think very highly of the stories because as I pointed out, Mm -hmm. um, Espinosa um, made them sound like Spanish speakers, and I mean Spanish speakers as in Spaniards. Um, what I tried to do um, when I went back to the stories is to figure out a way in which I could um, give back um, some of that um, Hibaro peasant Puerto Rican um, um, taste to, to, to the stories. Of course, I, I was working from the knowledge of um, um, my own family, um, both of my family uh, families, uh, father and mother are, are peasants themselves. So I was, I was um, very curious to see if I could, as I said, um, bring back that, um, that taste mm -hmm. um, that is so peculiar in, um, in uh, rural Puerto Rican Spanish. That's great. There's a question here I guess about sort of maybe folklore collection that's happened since then. Uh, so one of our attendees says that her grand, great grandfather left Puerto Rico to, to go to Hawaii mm -hmm. after a hurricane destroyed the sugarcane industry in the early 20th century. How, you know, is that folklore being captured? I think, you know, we have these sort of moments in time. Did you find that there are other sort of pockets of maybe uh, sort of literary work or anthropological work that's happened? Well, the, the, the history of Hawaii is very interesting. And um, oh my God, that question um, brings so many um, memories. Uh, my, my father um, was um, from Manati and um, Manati is an area that is very, even today is very well known for, for the pineapple um, um, fields. And my family, um, his family had a very small family farm of um, pineapples. Um, the story that I often hear is that um, they decided not to leave the island um, um, with, the, with the wave of um, farmers um, who were very well um, acquainted with the um, cultivation of pineapple. Actually, um, I don't know if this is still true, but um, with, with those um, peasants um, went varieties of pineapple that um, were in turn cultivated in, in Hawaii. So the answer to your question is yes, I am pretty sure that uh, there are um, Hibaro um, 
traditions in Hawaii. I hear that it's it's um, heard in the music. Um, I hear that there is um, a sort of a cuatro tradition in, in Hawaii. And um, those of you who are familiar with um, Puerto Rican music, the cuatro is a very um, cool um, guitar-like um, 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 instrument. That's great. The, um, so you come at this work as, a, as somebody who's done a lot of work in sort of literary criticism, right, and as a literary scholar. Uh, and so one of our attendees says, the translation of the stories looks fantastic. He's very excited to go out and get a copy. Uh, it raises questions for him about the relation between oral and written cultures. Yes. And he says, you know, some people mistakenly believe that things always move from oral to written. But do you have maybe a sense that maybe some of those more famous literary tales, and he points out the Cinderella, the Snow White ones, um, might have moved in a different way into Hibaro culture? Uh, yes. So um, what, um, what brought, what caught my attention big time mm -hmm. once I realized that many of the stories, and I wish, I wish um, that the, um, the actual manuscripts survived. There is no way for me to prove that whatever um, story that was pu eventually published was, was a written version or it was a transcribed version by, by Mason. But what I found incredibly important within the Puerto Rican, um, within the development of Puerto Rican literature is that these individuals who were Hibaros were writing many of these stories. Um, of course, there were writers who trained writers who um, were writing these stories at the time Mason was there, but um, although they had themselves um, a connection with um, Hibaro um, culture, by the time they were writing these stories, they were no Hibaros. And what I mean is that they were, they had educated themselves. Um, they were, as I call it, tainted by um, literary aesthetics and style. Whereas the, um, the informants that um, Mason preferred and he um, often um, insisted to Boas that they were muy bruto. Mm -hmm. And um, what I usually, um, what I did um, in terms of translation, what I think he meant was illiterate um, individuals. Um, these muy bruto um, um, informants were the ones that either um, told the stories to, to Mason or if they could read and write, um, wrote these stories. I should say that, um, as I said, um, I come from a family of peasants. My grandmother on my mother's side never learned to read and write. So when I am referring to the muy bruto um, informant, obviously these were people that could not read and write. My grandmother was a very good um, echadora de cuentos. Um, the, the, the phrase is very popular in Puerto Rico and it refers to the person who's always telling stories, either stories or anecdotes or jokes. I mean, this person is always um, saying something. And of course, this was before TV, of course, of course, of course, I belong to the TV generation, but um, um, these were individuals that entertained themselves like that without, without um, television. Are you at all afraid that that culture is disappearing as a result of our media changes? Oh yes, uh, and and um, the second part of this story that I I didn't um, um, bring to to this discussion, Mason went back to Puerto Rico when um, the park was um, made into a national park, okay. and um, um, the correspondence with um, the archaeologist who was. Um, the director of the Puerto R of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture is very interesting, because he continues the story about um, what he was doing. Um, Mason had many questions to um, Ricardo Alegría, that was um, the name of the archaeologist who who started the uh, Puerto Rican um, Culture Institute, and one of the questions that Mason had for him is. Um, do the Hibaros still um, sing or do the Hibaros still tell stories in, at wakes? And um, Alegría says, well, no, they're very busy now watching TV. <laughs>
Oh man, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this was in 1956. Yeah, wow. This is uh, this vein that we're in about sort of sources uh, it kind of intersects with some of the other questions. Um, for those maybe not familiar with the, the sort of history of Puerto Rican literature, um, how far back do the written sources go? And I really appreciated the way you were sort of distinguishing between the, maybe the different communities that are writing within there. Um, are there older sources for Hebrew culture or for maybe the sort of more the, bourgeois culture? Well, the, um, the, the first sources that we have are of course not written by them, but written by um, um, people who were either visiting the island mm -hmm. um, this would have been before the um, Spanish-American War. So say for instance, Spaniards who were visiting the island or Spaniards and Puerto Ricans who were writing um, um, chronicles about the development of the island. Mm -hmm. um, within those um, writings, we see glimpses of um, legends, anecdotes, stories, but um, the, the Hibaro literature as we know it today um, is a phenomenon of, a phenomenon of the 20th century. Great. And as I suggested, um, it was um, in part um, propelled by the arrival of Americans and um, how Puerto Ricans would have seen um, the, the federal impositions, uh, imposition um, um, upon Puerto Rican culture. Mm -hmm. um, I did not go into detail, but um, a good chunk of my book deals with the language issue. While Mason was going around trying to tell, um, trying to, um, or not trying, training teachers to have um, children write these stories in Spanish, of course, um, he never mentioned to Boas that um, Americans were trying to impose um, the uh, the use of English as the official language of the um, public school system. Sure, uh, such an important part of the, the colonial history there. That's uh, right. So there's uh, I now three different questions in my mind, but I'll try to not go in three different directions. One more, um, the our attendees are really fascinated by the uh, wax cylinder recordings. And they picked up on that, uh, the story you're telling about the way in which, is it Espinoza was trying to force into Castilian Spanish. Is there a way that maybe the wax cylinders actually record the vernacular? Um, yes, um, if you Google, if you Google um, Mason Puerto Rico recordings, um, there, some of them are available. Okay. So that, that would be very easy. Yes, the, the recordings are um, mainly songs or the ones available now are songs. I, um, I don't know if, um, Mason recorded actual storytellers telling stories. Um, and um, as I mentioned in passing, um, the recordings in Loisa are bombas. And um, for those of you who are into um, Caribbean and Puerto Rican musical um, scene, you know that um, bomba is still even, a, even today a very important um, um, musical um, genre. Um, very closely associated with um, the African um, uh, connection, the African culture of the island. Yeah, let's let's talk. Let's go back to that early part of your your presentation today. Uh, the the sort of two communities that were the focus: Louisa, the sort of maroon community, and then Ubuntu, the uh, the sort of peasant community. The, so uh, one of our attendees asked, you know, the geographic dichotomy of the highlands and the lowlands to denote racial differences between white and Hebrew and black cultures, mm -hmm. um, you know, our attendee says is actually rather common. He, he sees it in Puerto Rican studies. Where do you think that dichotomy comes from? Did the Boaz Mason research approach to data collection create it or perpetuate it or? Um, the first um, anthropologists that arrived in Puerto Rico after the um, uh, Spanish-American War mm -hmm. were very much interested in the black culture. Um, Walter Fakies, I, I never know how to pronounce it right, uh, was among mm -hmm. the first um, anthropologists that actually explored the Loisa um, area. Fakies and Boas were um, in, in communication. 
So um, I have in, in my book, I, ma I make the connection that um, uh, Mason knew about Eloisa through that connection. Mm -hmm. Boas, on the other hand, had a stronger connection with the Taino um, um, culture um, through various um, means. Mm -hmm. um, there were several um, Taino collections um, that were brought to the United States before um, um, 1898. Mm -hmm. And um, Boas would have come across um, those co um, collections. Um, so Boas knew about um, Utuado. Boas knew about Capa, which is the reason why um, the first letters from um, Mason to, to Boas are from Utuado. In this work, um, since we're thinking sort of about, about Luis in particular here, um, did you come across any information on uh, Bantu or Congo origins of the music of the bomba? Um, or? Mason, Mason didn't know how to um, label it or um, identify it. Um, he speaks about Congo, but um, as I come to um, understand, um, Congo seemed to have been to him a generic term for African. Yeah. Um, Okay. Even, even, even his name, um, Kong, uh, Meliton Congo, or it might have been that in Loisa, at the time that um, Mason was there, um, Loisa people were calling themselves Congo. Uh, I think we, we get a sense of uh, the, our, our global audience's awareness of the climate, <laughs> uh, the sort of environmental climate right now. And, and one of our attendees asks, um, is there much in the folklore about climate and the weather? Uh, and is that folklore maybe more relevant now, especially after Hurricane Maria and other elements of uh, global warming? So what I think happened, and um, I would have wished that um, Mason and Boas discussed the kind of questions, the kind of methodology that um, Mason was asking teachers mm -hmm. um, to do for um, the children. Mm -hmm. In my book, what I, um, what I theorize is that he had very peculiar questions or very particular questions that generated a series of particular short stories that in turn reflected the cultural questions that he was asking. For instance, um, there are no um, stories that speak about Tainos, indigenous people of any kind. And this is incredibly um, impossible because as, as I stressed to you, Boas and Mason were very much um, connected to Capa in Utuado. So even today, there are hundreds of stories about Taino myths. Um, the same about um, the Loisa stories. I know that there were stories because Meliton Congo um, referred them to, to Mason. Why did they decide um, not to publish those? Um, that's still very, um, it's very puzzling to me. No, no, it's fascinating. Um, so in addition to being a scholar, you are also an educator. So I, I wanna ask, what do you think of their approach of working with Puerto Rican children uh, as their source for collecting this information? That feels like a very uh, interesting choice, yes. right? They would have made in its collection path. Is that, uh, what do you think is the implication of that? And, and, and <laughs> I guess, would you do it <laughs> if you were? Well, um, the, the interesting part is that, um, they did not make this up. They were not the first ones to do it. I came across a couple of references of um, people who had um, um, Americans who owned companies on the island and as part of perhaps promotional um, campaigns, mm -hmm. they would have contests where they would ask children to write stories where they would ask children to write songs. Um, so um, yes, I agree with you. Um, why, why children? I mean, when, when I think of children, I don't think about them as uh, storytellers um, themselves. But I think that way in which you, you so nicely sort of lay out the, maybe the political work of this, right? That, and it, it, unfortunately, you know, 
that's what a, a century and five years ago. So there's probably no one alive who would have been remembered yeah. that. But it's interesting to think about whether that, in fact, did a certain sort of cultural work of in hearing those stories in a generation that ended up lasting longer. Although then, as we've talked, <laughs> TV came in. <laughs> um, so uh, we've we've kept you going for you know over 25 minutes now. <laughs> in questions, I don't want to wear you out entirely. No, there's a few questions in here about the Taino revival, uh, mm -hmm. and people are sort of curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you see that intersecting with your work. It's really very interesting. Um, um, all I can say at this point is that it, it, um, it has taken almost a, I want to say, a nat um, nationalist edge in which if the United States is not going to give independence to Puerto Ricans, the Taino nation groups organized as nations can claim for themselves that independence that the rest of the island does not have, if that, if that makes any sense. Right. And to me, I find this incredibly, um, powerful um, in many ways. Um, also the, the strong ethnic background that goes behind declaring yourself a descendant of an Taino um, nation is, is, is also um, powerful in its own. I mean, I don't know if I'm ask, uh, answering this correctly. Um, I hesitate because um, I know it's a, um, it's a very personal um, movement. Uh, as someone, I cannot claim um, Taino ancestry. So to me, as, a, as an outsider and um, as someone um, that comes from a hybrid um, family, but my hybridity does not include Taino. My mother, my mother is um, black, um, so I, I hesitate to sure. um, to claim that ancestry. But I know that it is a very um, powerful movement and um, a source of pride for the people um, who claim um, that Taino ancestry. Well, we very much appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that. And I think it's a good opportunity for us all to go and learn more um, for those of us who aren't, haven't um, familiarized ourselves with that, that very powerful movement. Um, so you, you have uh, broken my Q&A box. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. That's always a wonderful sign um, of, of you know, great, great appreciation and great interest in your work. I'm going to, uh, Adrian and I will download the questions and we'll send them to you. Yes, please. And if you're still um, listening to me, um, email me as well. You don't, oh, yes. have to, you don't have to contain yourself to the um, chat board. Excellent. So uh, this, and we've recorded this talk, so this will also be available on our YouTube channel. So for everybody out there, uh, please share it with your friends. Uh, let them know that there's this two wonderful books out, both from Rutgers Press. Um, and for everyone else, uh, we have some more events coming up next week. It's uh, a very different topic. Deborah Reed Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's wife's birthday next week. So we're going to be doing okay. a big event. Uh, but until then, thank you so much, Professor Acasio, for joining us today. And I very much look forward to jumping into all of your great scholarship. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming, everybody. Take care, all. <laughs>